If you're ready to read with me, somebody say, yeah. yeah. Verse 9, and it says this, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and... Y'all, we're going to have fun today. Y'all looking all nervous. Look at some of you. They don't be nervous. Look at some of you on the other side. Say, actually, you probably should be nervous. <laughs> Father God, we're grateful. God, we're thankful, God, for the opportunity, God, to be in your presence. God, you said wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you're going to be. And God, you wouldn't have shown up if it wasn't to do miracles, if it wasn't to speak to us, to, to move us forward in the purpose and the plan and the destiny that you have for us. So God, I decree and declare that not one person in this room, not one person watching online will remain the same, but they will have an in collision with heaven today. God, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Before you sit down, high five two people. Tell somebody, let's define this relationship. Come on, tell somebody, let's define... Let's define, let's define this relationship. Why is it that every time you start talking about money, people get awkward? Am I the only one? It's just every, they, I don't know if they think you're going to ask for money or something like that. But every, and it's not just a church thing. It's just every time people start, it's just like you get uncomfortable. And it's just one of those things you don't really want to talk about. And then it's even that much more so when you're in church. Some of y'all invited people and you're like, oh, gosh, I ain't know it was money serious. I want to invite you this Sunday. Like, oh, oh, that's all right. I left my wallet in the car. He ain't going to get me. It's going to be all the way good. Well, we're going to be talking about money over the next few weeks. And just to help you out, this is not a setup for an offering. We are having an offering the same time we have every year, the second Sunday in December. You got six months to prepare for that. But what I want to do over these next few weeks is to figure out what God's word says on an area that affects every single person's life. I was thinking about how I can, like, set this up and get you to, to kind of understand this, this whole deal. And, and here's the thought. Y'all know I'm crazy, and I've had four weeks to work on this, so I'm crazier than crazy. But I was thinking, whenever a guy and a girl, you know, they start talking, but they're not, like, officially dating. They're just talking, talking, but not like, that's my boyfriend or that's my girlfriend. It, it's an awkward season. Because I haven't quite claimed you, you haven't quite claimed me, so like the rules of engagement are, are, are undefined. Like I'm a gentleman, if I ask you out on a date, I'm going to pick you up, I'm going to pay for the meal, like I, that's how my daddy raised me, that's how we do it, that's fine, that's how we do it at Destiny Church, right fellas? Yeah. <laughs> Relationship series coming in February, but uh... <laughs> But, but that, 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 that's understood, or it is if you're at my church. But uh, what, what if we're out with friends? What if I didn't invite her? We're just with mutual friends. Do I still pick her up? Do I pay for her meal? I didn't invite her. <laughs> she ain't even sitting next to me, so why should I pay for her? Like, I mean, what do you do? Or maybe, ladies, you know, you're out with a guy and you're hanging out. You're not official. You're just, you know, talking, talking. You're walking through the mall and you see a pair of shoes like, oh, those are cute. I think I'm going to get them. And then you ask him, do you like these shoes? And he's like, nah, I don't like them. What do you do? He ain't your boyfriend. So technically, his opinion don't matter. <laughs> and if you like the shoes, do you get them and be like, well, bump you. When you claim me, then I might think about considering what you say. Or do you say, well, maybe if I, like, act like I listen to him now, he'll hurry up and, like, make this thing official. Like, what, what do you do? I mean, me, me and PZ, we were, we were actually in this situation, and we, we were actually dating. We were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time. Uh, we just weren't married, and my car went out, and, and I had to buy a new car. 
When I got a new car, and, you know, it was, it, was, it was new to me. It wasn't a new car, but it was new to me, and I could afford it. It was in my budget. It was all that other good stuff. And, you know, I went out, and, and, and I, I called her. I said, hey, I'm about to get this new car. I'm about to send you a picture. Let me know what you think. And I sent her the picture, and I said, hey, did you get the picture? <laughs> you ever been on the phone with someone and send them a picture, and your phone says it received? <laughs> but you didn't hear back, oh, that's. I said, hey, babe, did you get a picture? She said, this white one? I said, yeah, that's it. Now, now I got to be honest. I had made my decision before I called her. <laughs> like, the salesman, he had done his little voodoo on my head. Like, I had signed. I mean, I had already seen myself driving off in that car. This was just a formality. And I sent her the picture. She's like, I don't, I don't, I don't like it. Like, oh, I like, oh, man. Okay, cool. Well, I'll call you later. <laughs> Click. <laughs> hey, she wasn't my wife. I didn't have to listen to her. And I bought the car. Uh, and that car, let me be quiet, I'm preaching. And, uh, <laughs> and that car leaked into our marriage, and it was the worst car I have ever bought in my life. It was a lemon. I put more money in that. Ugh, it was bad. I should have listened. But <laughs> what I found is sometimes you find yourselves in, in these undefined relationships. And it's awkward and causes stress and anxiety because you're not quite sure what are the rules of engagement. And I'd like to submit to you that many of you have not defined your relationship with money. You have not told money where its position in your life is. And because that relationship is still undefined, there's a level of stress and anxiety and weight when it comes to your finances. Statistics show that 72% of Americans are under some level of financial stress. 72%. 44% of Americans say that they have more expenses in one year than they have income, and they balance it out by using credit cards. 42% of Americans have zero, working Americans have zero raise, uh, save for retirement. And most people in America said if a $1,000 emergency came up, I would not be able to meet it without borrowing money. There's this stress and this worry and this anxiety. And you're like, well, if I had more money, my problems would be solved. Talk to somebody with more money and they'll tell you, actually, your problems aren't solved. More money, more problems. <laughs> because now I have money, but I have to look like I don't. Because we live in this society where if I look like I have something, somehow I'm evil. Don't you know? There's hungry kids in, in, in I don't know where they are, but they're somewhere. And you shouldn't be living there. You shouldn't be driving that. You shouldn't be doing this. And then I have to realize that more money means that God has given me a responsibility. How do I steward this? How do I maximize this? How do I keep this money from ruining my children's morality and all this other kind of stuff? Listen, it was not designed to have that level of stress in your life. But if we insist on doing it without God's wisdom in our lives, it's going to be stressful. Yeah. Do you know that God has a lot to say about money? Yeah. And can I, can I just set you up here? God has a lot more to say about money than give it to the church. You may have only heard, hey, give it to the church. And that's a part of it. I'm not going to lie. It's a big part of it. But he has so much more to say about money than just give your tithes. 16 out of the 34 different parables in the Gospels are about money. It's kind of interesting. There's 288 verses in the oh, Gospels about money, which works out to be one-tenth. Interesting number. <laughs> one-tenth of all the verses in the Gospels are about money. Over 500 different verses in all of Scripture are about finances. Like, yeah, I know, because, you know, the preacher, the church, God, 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 God's trying to get my money. Well, let me just help you out here. The preacher, the church, and God don't need your money. God says the earth is mine and everything in it. If God is looking to provide, he's not asking your help. He has it taken care of. It is in Scripture because it breaks his heart that his people are under this stress and anxiety and worry and fear. And he wants us to have freedom in this area of our lives. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be unpacking what God's word says about finances. But today, the only thing I want to do today is help you define your relationship with money. So if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes... Write this down. You know the drill. <laughs> First thing is this. Money is a horrible master. Money is a horrible master. Have you ever had somebody that, that they defined a relationship but you didn't define it? 
Like they're calling themselves your friend or they're telling people y'all are dating and you don't remember that conversation? Come on, fellas, you know how it is. You, you play basketball at the same gym every week or whatever. You go to the same barbershop and you end up seeing, you know, the same guys or whatever. And the next thing you know, this guy starts telling everybody y'all are friends. Bro, we're not friends. We played basketball together. Like, we went to the same barbershop. Like, I don't even know you like that. If you see me in public, the only thing I want is a, and then keep moving. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I've been three married for six years, so I don't, I don't remember all the way being single in church, but I remember enough to know back then, and y'all can tell me if it's still like this, but if you're a brother and you were single in church, there was always that one girl that you weren't dating, but she was interested in you. And she was sending vibes out to all of the other girls. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't mess with my man. <laughs> now, you didn't claim her, but she just, I mean, you show up, how's it going? How's it going? And you're like, look, I haven't yet defined this relationship back off. Here's the thing about money. If you don't define the relationship, money will. If you don't tell money where it goes in your life, money will tell you where it goes in your life. The only problem is money doesn't want to be your friend and money doesn't want to be a romantic interest. Money wants to be your master. So if we don't define where money sits in our life, money says, fine, I control you. In Luke chapter 16, verse 13, this is Jesus speaking. He said, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will, and listen to the words Jesus used. He will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one. Remember that word loyal, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus is one of those guys when he preaches, it starts off as like an ambiguous analogy. And then next thing you know, he hits you right between the eyes. He, he, he's teaching this parable and he starts off about this servant who, who wasn't being a good manager of his master's money and he's about to lose his job. And the servant goes out and he starts fudging the numbers on all his master's debtors so that if he gets fired, one of them will like him and hire him. And then all of a sudden, God transitions out of that parable into talking about, hey, if you can't be trusted with money, who's going to trust you with big things? If you can't be trusted with little things, then you're going to be unrighteous and ungodly with big things. I was like, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. And then all of a sudden, he lands with, you're going to have a master, now pick. Whoa, Jesus, this just got real intense. And one of the things that we feel like in church is we feel like we pick God's way or Satan's way. But yet, that's not the analogy or that's not the option that Jesus gave them. So you're going to have a master, so you need to pick, but you can't have two. You can't serve God and mammon. Now, some translations say you can't serve God or money, but money is actually a misinterpretation of the word. The actual word is the word mammon. Y'all want to do a little bit of a history trip? Uh, good deal. I'm glad you did because we were going to do it anyway. <laughs> Where does mammon come from? Well, mammon is the Aramaic word for riches. Mammon is riches in Aramaic, and the word mammon was actually the name of the Assyrian god of riches. The Assyrians were a nation, and they were invading and taking over, and they had a god, and their god was mammon, and that was the god of riches. Y'all tracking with me? Well, Babylon, who's ever heard of Babylon before? That's like everything Bob Marley ever talked about. But Babylon <laughs> was it? y'all didn't expect me to go there. Pray for me. Babylon is the nation that took over Syria but kept the god of Mammon. So the god of Mammon transferred from Syria to Babylon. Now, where did Babylon come from? If you break down the word Babylon, the first word, you can break it down to the word Babel. Babel simply means confusion, chaos. And if you add the suffix on the Babylon, that last part means planted or sown. So the word Babylon means planted, initiated, started in chaos. If you remember in Genesis, it started when people got together and they said, let's build the tower of Babel. Everybody on the planet, they spoke the same language and said, hey, let's build a tower that gets us to heaven without God's help. And it says they all worked on building this tower, and God looked down and said, hey, we have to stop them lest they succeed. That's a message for a different time. But how many people know if two or three gather and agree on anything that it will be done? God understood the power of unity. 
So in that moment, he changed their language. Everybody started speaking a different language, and they weren't able to complete the tower. But here's the point. The origin of Babel is let's move God out of the way, and let's do it on our own. Let's figure out how to be immortal, immortal, how to be internal, how to get to heaven without using God or without, it was too much history. Y'all are going to be like, oh my gosh, where are we? Okay, let me give you back to it. Here's what the spirit of mammon is. As long as you have money, you don't need God. The spirit of mammon is the mindset that as long as I have enough money that I don't really need God to rescue me or to be my God or to step into this situation because I have enough money. Here's the problem. Money lies. Money makes promises that only God can keep. Money promises to keep you safe. I'll tell you right now, there is no greater source, I think, outside of maybe a child being sick, of stress and anxiety than not having money or not having enough money to be able to meet your bills. I was actually in that situation. I'm, I've always been a little bit overambitious, and my risk meter is a little bit broken, and I just jump out and do things. So I graduated college. I got a good job. And when I was 22 years old, I bought my first house. It was a foreclosure, and I just figured, you know, I'll live it and fix it up and all that other good stuff. Well, six months into the house, I realized that I had bitten off more than I could chew, and I couldn't make the mortgage. And I'm writing checks and sending them on a certain date. So they hit on this date right when the direct deposit comes in. And I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul. And I'm stressed out because I couldn't make my bills. And it's like, how embarrassing is this? My dad taught me better. How am I in this situation? And I didn't realize it, but I actually wasn't even sleeping at night. I would go to bed and I'd close my eyes, but instead of sleeping, I'd be turning in my mind, how do I figure this out? How do, what am I going to do? How am I going to get myself out of this situation? There is few stresses and anxiety like financial stress. And the spirit of mammon capitalizes on that and says, hey, money is such a source of stress in your life. If you just had more money, you'd have no problems. If you just had more money, you'd be safe. If you just had more money, you'd have more influence. If you just had more money, people would like you. If you just had more money, you wouldn't be single. If you just had more money or whatever it may be, and all of a sudden money becomes the solution to all your problems. Here's the only problem. Money can't keep those promises. Because no amount of money can help you when you have a child that's strung out on drugs. No amount of money can heal you of a debilitating disease. Money can't heal a broken heart. Money can't fix the If I just had more money, I'd be more happy. Not true. You just have bigger things to make you more unhappy. Money can't save your soul. Money's not bad. But when it takes the place of God in our life, it becomes a problem. And God says, here's the thing, you have to pick who are you going to put your trust in, the spirit of mammon, money, or are you going to put your trust in God? Now, I have bad news and I have worse news. <laughs> All of us are either currently under the spirit of mammon or we have been at some point. Can I prove it? All of us have been in a situation where we were thinking about making a shift. Should I go to this college? Should I take this job? Should I move to this different city? Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do this? And your first thought was, how much is it going to cost? How much am I going to pay for it? When your first thought should have been, is this God's will? If my first thought is, how much is it going to cost? Then that means that money is making my decisions for me. And whoever makes my decisions is my master. Pastor, I mean, I mean, that, that sounds cute and all that kind of stuff. I know you had four weeks to work on this, but, but that don't make sense because money matters because I'm not going to be dumb. If I can't afford something, then I'm not going to do something. Listen to me. If God's called you to do something, he'll pay for it. And God's not sitting around looking at your bank account before he plans your destiny. Oh, I want to use, oh, no, you broke. I can't. I'm going to wait till you get that together. God's not sitting around looking at your bank account to make his plans. Let me give you an example. 2017, Destiny Church. We, we were in a high school. God was blessed, and the church was growing, probably about 600 people at the time. And, 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 and we were coming up on our Vision Sunday. And by the way, I just want y'all to know, I'd be reading them vibes y'all be sending. Them, them subliminal. We, 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 we'd been in high school for two years. It was great. God was blessing. Hundreds of people were getting saved. But the church was starting to send the vibes of pastor when we going to get out this high school. 
Like nobody actually said it, but you, hey, any luck finding a building? <laughs> it was just this, when we going to be a real church? Like, and I could feel the vibes, and I was just like, I'm trying, guys. Like, God's moving. Like, leave me alone. But anyway, so I prayed through and all kind of stuff, and, and, and we, we started looking for stuff, and we realized that we were going to need about a million dollars to be able to purchase a place or to renovate a place that we would lease. So I got up in our Vision Sunday. It was four weeks before our offer, and I said, hey, guys, I just want to get you and kind of let you know where we are. We're going to need about a million dollars to be able to move. This is not putting pressure on you whatsoever. I just want you to know that the rate that we're going at right now, it's going to take the church about 18 to months to two years to be able to save a million dollars. So sit tight. Y'all going to be in this high school for a while was pretty much what I was trying to say with full of vision and hope and all that other good stuff. And it wasn't like put a pressure on, on people to give a million dollars. We don't pressure people at all. We just, this is what it is and blah, blah, blah. Four weeks come by, the church gives. 600 people gave $250,000. It was the largest offering we had ever given the church. Somebody say amen to God. Amen. It was amazing. It just wasn't a million dollars. It was great. It was faith. It just wasn't a million. And I wasn't stressed and I wasn't disappointed at all. It was a bigger offering. I didn't expect us to give it, so it was all the way good. Actually, ran out of town, went on vacation for a week. We were in February. We were in Fort Lauderdale just kind of hanging out. And I got an email the week after the offering from a church that says, hey, we have a building um, that we're trying to get out of. And we were wondering, would you be interested in moving into our building? The church didn't even know us from Adam. They emailed us at Easter at MyDestinyHarvest.com, which means the only way they heard about it is they got an Easter mailer or something like that. And they said, we've got this building, and we were wondering, would you take it over? By the way, we've put $800,000 worth of renovations into the building that we're willing to walk away from. We just need... Y'all clapping because y'all didn't see the miracle like I saw the miracle. What should have taken two years, God did in four weeks. Because God is not concerned about what we have. He says, I own the world. I'm just looking for somebody who's going to trust me over the pressures in their lives. Can I just be ignorant for a second? If you're a single woman and you're more concerned about how much he makes then whether he tithes, you're under the spirit of mammon. Because you're trusting his income to provide for you instead of the fact that he's submitted to Almighty God. Now, I'm not saying that money is evil. Mon mon money is aspiritual. Money is neither evil and money is not righteous. Our relationship to money is what determines whether it's good or bad. You ever heard that verse, money is the root of all evil? Steve Harvey was doing some stand-up, and he said, you know, all these Christians, they say money is the root of all evil. I'll tell you, being broke is pretty evil, too. <laughs> the Bible actually never said that money is the root of all evil. This is what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. The love of money. There's nothing wrong with money. It only becomes a problem when you fall in love with it. The love of money is the root, not of all evil, of all kinds. It's like, can, can, can I talk in here? When you got money, you get really creative in how you can sin. When you broke, there's only a couple ways you can sin. Like, I ain't getting on a private jet and sinning in Fiji if I'm broke. Like, it's going to be this three-block radius of where I live. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Watch this. Some have wandered away from the faith and impaled themselves with a lot of pain because they made money the goal. Yeah. Money's not a problem, but it is when it's a goal in your life. And I'll just be honest with you, as a pastor, I see this all the time. People come to church desperate for God. All these degrees, but no purpose or destiny for their life. Marriages on the rocks or children not serving God or just struggling with whatever they may be. And they come to church and they meet God and God brings hope and God brings healing. And they start growing in their relationship with God and they find purpose and they find destiny. And the devil knows it and he tries to abort it. So miraculously, all of a sudden your boss says, you got to work on Sundays now. Or all of a sudden, there's like three, four weeks in a row where you have a business deal that you got to fly out to here and fly out to there. And next thing you know, you've gotten out of the rhythm of coming to the house of God. And you look up six months, you can't remember the last time you've been to church because your focus on money caused you. It didn't say steal. It says wonder. 
almost unintentionally and not paying attention, I just find myself outside of trusting God. Remember, Mammon was the god, the god of riches over Assyria. I want you to write something down. I want you to read it on your own. I don't have time to read it, but I just want to give this to you. It's in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 14. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 14. The Assyrian nation is invading Israel. Hezekiah is the king of Judah at the time. They're invading. They took over a bunch of the cities, and they're coming for Jerusalem. And Hezekiah sends out a message. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are you killing people, man? Like, calm down. He said, I'll pay you to leave. The king of Assyria said, I want 350 talents to leave. One talent is one year's salary. He said, I want 350 times the average salary. The average salary in America is about $52,000 per household. $52,000 times 350 is somewhere around $20 million. He said, you give me $20 million, I'll leave. Hezekiah gave it to him. But guess where Hezekiah got it from? He stole the tithe. Hezekiah went to the temple and he took what people had given, 300 different families had given tithes, and he took that money and he gave it to the Assyrian, the god of mammon. You know what the Assyrians did after they got the money? Psych, we're still going to kill you. Because it was never about the money. It was always about controlling you. Pastor, I can't tithe. I can't afford it. I, I got to meet this bill and I got to meet that bill and I got to do this and I got to do that. Can I be honest with you? When you steal God's tithe to meet your bills, when the bills are met, there will still be problems because it was never about the bills. It was always about the enemy wanting to control you by your fear of not having it is a horrible master. The second thing is this. Money is a horrible master, but money is a wonderful tool. Now, here's, here's what happens. Some of you are convicted because you don't tithe or you're going after money or whatever it may be. So you're squirming. You can't wait to get out of here. Some of y'all self-righteous folks, y'all are in here. And you're just like, oh, you better tell them, preacher, tell them. I've been tithing since I was four. <laughs> Woo, this is good. This is good word. This is good. This is Bible. This is Bible. Here's the problem. You're like, I don't care about money. Money's not my goal. And money means nothing to me. I, I'm fine. My needs are met. I don't need any more money. If you have the, the mindset that you don't need any more money, I'd like to submit to you, that's not the heart of God. I'm good. My needs are met. I'm good. My needs are met. I'm good. My needs, I'm good, my needs are met are one of the most selfish things you could ever say in your life. Because as long as all you can do is meet your needs... You can never have an impact on anybody around you. And Jesus doesn't just want you to meet your needs. He wants you to be able to be a blessing to people around you. 2 okay. Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11 says this, God will make you rich. Pastor, why are you yelling? Well, because the word rich makes people uncomfortable. Oh, here we go again with that prosperity gospel. And you're going to take an offering in a second. I see it coming. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. If you bring $9.11, the Lord is going to bring your breakthrough. <laughs> why is it that we get so uncomfortable about the word rich? Can I tell you why? Because the enemy knows that if I can keep the church skeptical about money, if I can keep on throwing up these different churches and pastors that abuse it and misuse it and use it to manipulate people and have people like, oh, I don't want anything to do with that, then I can keep them in slavery in this area. Yeah. And if I can keep them in slavery in this area, I can keep them from thinking about, can I be honest with you? This is me just talking. If I can't make my bills, I don't care about people going to hell. Pastor, you talking about planting churches in PG County and Rockville and Munger, they could all go to, you know, where? Because I can't make my mortgage right now, and that's what I'm concerned about. So you go on serve day on Saturday. I ain't trying to show the love of God because I can't see the love of God in my life. So we're going to just let them be them. Uh, as long as money is a stress in our lives, we can never truly be kingdom-minded. And the enemy says, let me keep them in bondage so that they can't see that there's something bigger than their world. He said, I want to make you rich. By the way, 
Here is the difference between the so-called prosperity gospel and what the Bible teaches. Two words. So that. Here's what's wrong. God wants to make you rich. Okay, close your Bible. Let's pray. It's been a good service. Is that true? Yes. But it's a half-truth. The half-truth is not true at all. It says God wants to make you rich so that. Somebody say so that. There's a purpose to the wealth so that you can always be generous. Your generosity will produce thanksgiving to God because of us. He says, I want you to have more than enough. So here's what I need you to do. I'm not saying that God wants everybody to have a certain net worth, but here's what I'm saying, and I want to say it slowly so you understand. You pick the standard of living that you want to have. You pick. What's God's will for life? You have the mind of Christ. You pick. Pick where you want to live. Pick what you want to drive. Pick. Pick how you want a vacation. You want a vacation two blocks away? Two countries away. You pick. But once you've picked, just understand God wants you to have more than that. Whatever you pick, God needs you to have more. Because if you just have enough to meet your needs, you can never get into the kingdom of God's way, which is more than enough so that you can be generous on every occasion. Let's break this down even more. How rich do I need to be to be able to respond to every need I encounter? Like, think about that. Like, forget people who don't have your last name. Just think about how many people in your family have needs that would be blessed if you can meet it. And God says, I need you to have more than enough so that when you have a niece or a nephew or whatever it may be that's getting ready to drop out of college because they don't have enough to finish that last semester and they don't want to take on more debt, you can say, don't drop off. I'll take care of that semester. You go on. You finish that or whatever it may be. He said, I want you to have more than enough so that you can be generous on every. It is a wonderful tool. It's a couple of things that we can use finances for. The first thing we can use finances for, not the only thing, but the first thing is to advance the kingdom of God. Watch this. In Luke chapter 16, verse 9, can you throw that up? He said this. He said, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, worldly riches, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I kind of have a secular mind. So when I read this verse and he said, hey, use money to make friends so they'll welcome you. I thought what it was saying is, hey, use money to bribe people. (laughs) That's just me. I need more Jesus. That, hey, if you ever lose your job or fall on hard times or whatever it may be, you got people that are going to have your back. They're going to hook you up with another job. That's what I thought it meant. But as you read it, it says, use unrighteous rant, man, to make friends for yourself that when you fail, they will welcome you into an everlasting home. Let's work this verse from back to front. Everlasting home, eternal home. There's only one eternal home, and that's Jesus said, I go to my father's house to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you, in my father's house there are many mansions or many houses. He says, hey, home is in heaven. Here is temporary. So it says they're going to welcome you into heaven. Then it says they'll welcome you when you fail. I always thought it meant when I filed for bankruptcy or something like that. No, no, no. It didn't mean when your money fails. It meant when your heart fails. Like the final failure. Like. (laughs) (laughs) And when it says use money to make friends, it doesn't mean like we cool. It means use money to make brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's what the verse is saying. A good use of your money is to help other people meet Jesus because when you die and get to heaven, there's going to be people waiting for you when you get there saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you had not given to plant that church in West Palm Beach, if you had not given to plant that church in Alexandria, Virginia, I would not be in heaven. Thank you for your generosity. Backtrack to 2017, 600 people at Destiny Church gave $250,000 so that we can be in this building. Between the first Sunday in this building till today, 1,977 people have made a decision to follow Christ in a service. 
Many of you are in this room right now because of somebody else's generosity. He said, use unrighteous men for eternal purposes. You may not hear this at many churches, though. Giving to the church is not the only use of money. It's one. It's not the only one. Another one is to meet your needs. How many people know I got some needs, too? God says, yes, yes, I'm going to meet your needs, but I'm going to meet your needs through money. Go ahead, pay your bills. T take care of you. And when you're finished meeting your needs, then be a blessing to yourself and your family. There's this mindset that, that God just wants me to be humble and not really have anything. And as long as I can eat and my daily bread, I'm good and I'm fine or whatever it may be. That's a Babylonian mindset. Yeah, how could you drive a car like that? Don't you know there's hungry kids in? I don't got time to tell you how I feel about that. You think that money is limited. That's why you have that mindset. That if one person is rich, it means that another person is poor because that rich person stole or manipulated. Your money is limited. God's is not. There's not hungry people in this world because there's rich people in this world. There's hungry people in this world because there's a clog between heaven and poverty. God gives it to people to meet those needs and it gets stuck in their hands. And it never gets to the place that it's supposed to go. It's not that there's not enough. It's that we're, 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 we're about me and mine, so we're not thinking about being generous on every single occasion. The issue of poverty in this world is a heart issue. It's not a resource issue. Hmm? So, hey, be a blessing to yours. There's nothing. God doesn't mind you having stuff. He just minds stuff having you. When you're finished being a blessing to yourself and to your children, be a blessing to other people. Last thing is this. Write this down. Money is a horrible master. Money is a wonderful tool. But money is a tool to be mastered. Money is a tool, but if you don't know how to use it, it could hurt you. I, I have a brother that he just likes weapons. He's, he's just, he's just kind of that kind of guy. He's the guy, don't break into his house. It'll be a problem. He'll have to wait for 15 minutes to figure out how to hurt you. Um, which one should I pick? Probably shouldn't say that, right? Oh, it's hilarious though. Anyway, this brother, he has like 50 different switchblades. And I don't know if y'all ever seen switchblades, but each one is different. And where the blade pops out of is usually different. So you hit one, you hit him, you hit another one, it flicks up and all that. If you've never used that tool before and you hit that button wrong, that thing could... Is that graphic enough? <laughs> Money's the same way. If you don't know how to work it, it could cause more pain than blessing in your life. And this is Pastor Stephen, and I'm coming for your life. There's some of you in this room like, well, I don't, I don't really deal with finances. My husband handles all the money. Or my wife handles all the money. It, it, it's not my deal. Or I'm not a numbers person. Like, I make money, I pay my bills, but I'm not a number. It's not my thing. I don't really care about money. We, we say some dumb stuff to sound humble, and it, it's, it's not humble. I don't care about money. Well, God does. We should probably care about what he cares about. And not only does God care about money, but he watches how we manage money to see if he can trust us with bigger things. Luke 16, 11 says this, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true Riches. God actually watches how, I believe this as a church, it's why we're so uh, fickle about how we manage the tithe and the offering here. It's why we always put a financial report online. I'm, I, I want to be integrous before you, but it's not really about you. I know God is watching our church and our trustees how we manage money to determine if he could give us something more valuable, which are souls. And I believe God's like, well, if you're funny with the money, I can't give you this city. Because if you'd be dishonest with money, how dishonest will you be with people? Yeah. It, 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 it graduates us to more important things. So how do I manage money? There's three things you can do with money. The first thing is this. You return the tithe. Tithing is not the only thing you can do with money, but it is the first thing you do with money. 
And notice I said return, not give or pay. Some people say, I pay my tithes. You don't pay your tithes because it was never yours. You can't give your tithes because it belongs to him. I'm just returning to him what's already his. And since we're already having the talk, I got some bad news for you. Some of you in this moment, the money in your bank account and in your retirement account is cursed. Dang, man, why you got to say it like that? Bible. Malachi 3.8 says this, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed? Nobody in their right mind would break into a church and rob it. But yet God says, you've robbed me. How? In tithes and offerings. Now, I'm not going to lie. When I was prepping this message, the tithing part, I, my, man, I grew up in one of them crazy homes where my dad used to make me tithe off of birthday money. I used to be so mad. I'm like, this is not increase. This is a gift. And I used to say, if I got a remote control car, would I have to give one wheel to Jesus? Like, this isn't fair. <laughs> like, I just grew up in a house where you don't play with the tithe. So I've always tithed. It's, when I've been broke, I've been tithed. It's not been an issue. But it didn't just say just tithe. It says tithe and offering. What's an offering? An offering is when God lays on your heart to give above and beyond your tithe. And not just to the church, but to anywhere. So when I walk by that homeless person, and the Holy Spirit says to give, and the first thing I do is check their sneakers to see if they're really homeless. Am I only an ignorant person? <laughs> you ain't really homeless, man. How much you make on this corner? Like 14 an hour? Like, <laughs> you probably live down the street from me. You'd be all right. And the whole, <laughs> ignorant people, come on now. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit says to give, and I keep on walking. Guess what I just did? I just robbed God. Because the Bible says, in the least that you do it unto my brethren, you've done it unto him. Listen, all giving is giving to God, not just giving to the church. If I'm doing it in the name of God, it's unto God. And if he told me to do it and I didn't do it, I robbed him. He said, you robbed me in tithes and offering. Watch this. He said, you are cursed with a curse. That's like a double curse. You're cursed with a curse. Well, what else can I be cursed with? I mean, why you got to be so extra? He said, you're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. This is the scary part. Even the whole nation. Man, I'm tithing, Pastor. I'm good. That's cool. That means you're blessed, but not necessarily the church is. Because God judges us as a body. So if 60% of us honor God with the first of our tithe and 40% says, I'm not about that life, we're 40% not blessed. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer. He said, when you get this right, when you honor me with the first, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Here's what the Bible says. It says, when you give God the first, the, blessed is the rest is blessed. That the tithe actually cancels Satan's authority access into our lives. Now, here's the problem. You've heard preach, give to get. That when I give, God's going to give back to me, pressed down, shaking together, and running over, which is Bible. But here's the problem. God never said that when you tithe, he'll give you more money. He said when you tithe, he'll rebuke the enemy from your life. So some people think, I don't need a tithe. My needs are met. I have more than enough. I don't need more money, so I don't need to use God's system for getting more money. It's not a system for getting more money. It's a system for rebuking the devourer. He didn't say he'll attack your money. He said he'll attack your life. Some of you aren't tithing, and your money is fine, but your relationship with your teenager is jacked up. And you may not realize it, but your teenager understands that there's a spirit in the home where my parents are not under the authority of God. And because they haven't placed this, they won't say this through words, but it's a spirit of rebellion that has authority in your home because you've removed yourself from the blessing of God. 
The first thing you do is return the tithe. The second thing is this, steward and enjoy. And we are going to break this down. We're actually bringing in one of the, the, the most gifted people in the Dave Ramsey community, and he's going to come and do a financial seminar for the entire church just to teach us how to steward our resources. Listen to me. Tithing is not the only thing that God says in the Bible. It's just the first thing. And what has so many people in a jam is you've given the first 10% to God, but you're not a good steward of the other 90%. And just because you tithe doesn't mean God's going to bless your mess. He doesn't, he doesn't bless foolishness. So we have to learn how to budget. I know it may be a curse word in your life, but it's not. I'm telling you, it's a blessing. We got to learn how to live on less than we make. Some of y'all got to learn how to enjoy what God's given you because you're enjoying it wrong. Pastor, all of everyone wanted was a BMW. Yes, get you a BMW after you fund your kid's college fund. There is a time and a season for everything. Pastor, all my friends, we're going to Fiji, then we're going to Malta, we're going to Barcelona, we're going to cruise the whole Mediterranean. It's going to be amazing. Go on the cruise, but not with $78,000 of student loans. That loan is going to sink the cruise. <laughs> Pay the loan off first, and then God wants you to enjoy it. But listen, if it's not at the right timing, it won't be a blessing. It'll be a curse. So we return the tithe, we steward and enjoy wealth. And the last thing is we give extravagantly. You haven't gotten to the place of having fun with your money until you're able to be generous on every single occasion. When you're out to dinner with your friends and the bill never shows up because you slipped your card to the waiter before they could even bring it out and all your friends are digging in their wall and you're like, I took care of you took, no, what, oh, why'd you, how'd you, oh, it's taken care of, that's fun. Man, it's fun to watch somebody come into church and out of church and struggling and bumming rides and all that because their car is all jacked up and you after one service should be able to hand them the key and say, hey, this is yours. <laughs> and see tears streaming down their face. I'm telling you, it's fun fun to be a blessing, but it only happens when we learn how to use this tool that God's given us, and we do it His way. Somebody shout amen. amen. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. God, we're thankful. God, that because of you in our life, we can be removed from under this spirit of man and the spirit of financial fear and anxiety. I decree and declare in the name of Jesus that all stress, all fear, all anxiety, all worry is broken off of this church in the name of Jesus. Every person blessed. Every person with more than enough. And God, give us not a heart of selfishness, but God, give us a heart, God, to be generous on every single occasion and through our generosity, bringing glory unto you. Just where you're sitting, if you could pray this prayer with me, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Just give God a message, whether you're watching online or, or, or sitting in the room. Just give God a moment to make this time personal to you. I tell you this, if God doesn't have your money, he definitely doesn't have your heart. And he's more concerned about your heart than he is about your money. So many people think that being a Christian means that I believe in Jesus. The Bible says even demons believe in Jesus and they tremble. Believing in Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. Giving him control of your life does. That's what the word Lord means. So maybe you're in here and you're like me and you grew up in church. You just never gave control to God. Maybe this is your first time and you say, you know what? I've been my own God, I've been all my own master, and I've been messing this up. And today I want to give God control of my life. If that's you, it'd be my greatest honor to introduce you to a God that loves you more than you can love yourself. I'm not going to have you stand up or come up front, but right where you're sitting, right where you're watching, can you pray this prayer with me? Matter of fact, the entire church out of those that are, are making the greatest decision, can you pray this? Say, Lord Jesus, in this moment, I surrender. I give you control of my life. Be my Lord, be my master, be my savior. 
and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name.